this whole process is, uh, seems mysterious to anybody who doesn't in actual fact do it. That is to say that here on this desk and, and these notes, you see, are the propositions for a set of music, or first musicians to play a certain sound. And if I have done my technical job correctly, then that will come out as a sound which I sort of hear in my head very accurately. And if I have gone done my work long enough and over a long period and worked out at a whole work, then something which may take as long as two or three years to make, as an opera would, may come out at a length of one and a half or one and three quarter hours of continuous music in a theatre. I'm Andrew Porter. Michael Tippett, whom I believe to be the greatest of living composers, is at once a poet and a visionary and a craftsman. The craftsman labors to give precise form in musical sounds to the visions that inspire him. Visions where the past, the future, and the present combine. Visions of men and women suffering and rejoicing, of wise, mellow age and exuberant youth, of the immense, unknowable infinity that surrounds our life and the small, brightly lit areas of experience and emotion that we can explore in detail. Tippett was born in London in 1905, but he's not an Englishman. He's a Cornishman, and that's something rather different. Cornwall is the Celtic part of England, where her dreamers and her prophets come from. They can see the dark undersurface of things as well as the shining surface. They can know winter and springtime at once. My generation in particular has had to take consequence of what it was to have lived in a springtime which corresponded to a springtime outside and then live through a kind of disillusion which was incredibly profound, as profound as it is now. And then comes the next point when inside this Europe, which I, so to speak, looked at from, looked at from, from across the channel, inside this Europe there was an unrest and disturbance much, much deeper. None of us, I think, understood what it was, how evil it was, what the thing was. But there it came, and this notion that somehow the whole of the civilizations was going down or was being blown up or forced into the most horrible, unbelievable obscenities. I had a sensitivity that was extra at that time to this particular feeling, and bit by bit, I came to believe that I had to come out of a shell of music in which I was simply learning my own job. I had to come out of the cellar in which Beethoven was and go actually, as it were, metaphorically out and think what this was. And that came to me eventually in the sense that, that when, the, when there was a possible a, a, to write a work, an oratorio in fact, which I called eventually a child of our time.
Bach composed his Matthew Passion and John Passion, he summed up communal aspirations of yearning, hope, despair in well-known chorale hymn tunes. For the same purpose in A Child of Our Time, Michael Tippett used black spirituals. In the Second World War, I begin at once to write this piece. And it's about what happens to a young man who in, is thrown out of society, who in this sense is a, a scapegoat, etc., etc. And then I found myself, by, an, by, an, by a curious coincidence, if you like, I found myself as, a, as what's it, thrown out by my society because I had a feeling coming from, the very, from my early days and the, of the first, after the First World War that I could not take place. I could not do the things which modern war demanded. I was what is called in England a conscientious objector and eventually because I wouldn't do con the conditions which were given me I was sent to prison. You know going to a prison is a strange experience. That's to say if you're not real a felon and you go to an ordinary prison is something that you don't expect to do but in, if you are somebody who feels they have to do so for forms of conscience then you have to accept it and and go forward. It, for me it had a special significance if I dare say that because I had already written a child of our time and that contained an aria which says the boy sings in his prison and I had imagined what it was like to be in a prison where you can't see the sky and you can't see the can't walk on the earth or hear the natural sounds that exist It's interesting that when I was g going to write A Child of Our Time, and I had to have a text just before the, before the last war, I went to talk to T.S. Eliot, the poet, about it, because he had been like a father to me, and was till he, almost to his death, telling me a, a lot about what he thought theatre was, what he thought opera was, ballet, plays, and was such an extraordinary father figure to me that I wondered, even though I was a young and tyro, as to whether he couldn't help me, even to the point perhaps of, of actually writing a text. And he said he would. But he wanted to have everything done in what he called given his homework, so that he'd know how many words, which I knew what he meant by this, these are technical questions. He wanted to know what kind of piece each thing was, each number, how many words I thought I needed and what sort of thing it was, etc., etc. So he, I went away and did, in fact, write for him down a kind of text and a kind of description on the other side of the piece of paper as what this text was to do. He took it and lo looked at it, and, and well, I went back to him in his office some long time after, some two or three weeks afterwards, in fact, and he said, look, Michael, you've done this in a way which is interesting, and you better do it and finish it yourself, because if I, as a poet, do do some other thing upon it, do write, I write words, they'll stick out a mile as being marvellously better poetry. He meant this, uh, he was teaching me, you see, that he taught me this elementary thing, that if you want to put, do things, as he would say, to the words which the music is going to do, and that the words are going to be sort of absolutely disappear within the music, then the words must not have such a vitality that they themselves stick out of the music. And that was one, one of his lessons. However, from this came, as you, as you can guess, the, the realization that I'd have to learn how to, to um, write texts. Now, this is not poetry, not necessarily anything, texts in order that this could do what I wanted to do as, a mu as music and, he, and, the el and the elementary but deadly serious matter that it, the composer does it best when he knows exactly what he has got to do musically and, bef and to into which the words are going to, though he may invent the words and the music at the same time. Act uh, Eliot, of course, 
I knew Eliot's poetry then, in and out, and I was very moved by all of it, and also not only by his poetry, but by his whole attitude to, to what life was like. And he told me to, to read Yeats. And Yeats was a, another different experience, because Yeats was an aristocratic, he was... He, 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 and he was, he was romantic in a different way. He believed in what he called the grim and gay, and, that, and he has, that, that even though the world was as grim as it could conceivably be, yet he said that we as actors within this world might at least be cheerful. It wasn't for, it wasn't for us necessary to weep the whole time. And he actually refused to put in, in a collection of anthology of, of English poetry that he did, he, he, he wouldn't put in poetry out of the First, out of the first World War because he regarded this as not the thing that poetry could be made out of. He wanted out of heroics. So out of Yeats came the complementary thing, this belief that also the, the dark world was one thing, but the magic world and the world of heroics was another, and from this in the end came, came the first major work, I suppose, which is in the center of the whole of, the, of my music, and that is the, uh, the, uh, the opera, The Midsummer Mary. The Midsummer Marriage is the tale of Mark, an ardent, impetuous youth who plans to run away with Jennifer, the beautiful but slightly chilly daughter of a rich industrialist. Mark's dreams are of a rich, fruitful, sensual life in the warm earth. Jennifer's are of a magic staircase leading to the purity of heaven. The dreams take on concrete shape on the stage before us, and each character must learn to experience the other's dream before they can be united in marriage. As a libretto, the Midsummer Marriage is really something of a muddle. Tippett has never learnt to use words as well as he uses notes. But it's a rich model, the ideas are beautiful, and the music has great emotional precision and eloquence. It pours out in a brilliant, fertile stream, glowing and dancing, like the love in Mark's heart as he stands in the English countryside, watching the lark and dreaming his dreams. I might be talking about Dante, Blake, Wordsworth, or Beethoven. And while not wanting to set up any hierarchy of greatness, I do mean to suggest that Michael Tippett is a creator of their kind, a man through whom currents of world thought and world feeling seem to flow, a creator whose works are adventures that enrich our understanding. They can help us to order our experiences of the world and then add to the sum of those experiences the joy that they themselves bring. Why isn't his music more widely performed then? I don't really know. It's maybe difficult to sing and to play, but it's not difficult to understand. Perhaps because Tippett is not associated with any fashionable school of composition. Perhaps because he lives in the country and not in one of the bustling international music marketplaces where the promotion gets done. I learned how to use the internal things in myself towards the, to, to, to find the, and with the antennae of the fingers what it is that, that we have to discover why you, the artist um, using the poet has to have always an open inside, an inside which is open to the interior world, however ca catastrophic, however violent, however whatever it is, however magical, however beautiful, if that term could still be used. So from Jung I learned a language and this language was not only a language in myself, but a language of metaphor in actual words, and certainly, and some apprehension which was deeper than myself, 
really deeper than myself about what the collectives would be within which we have to live our life as we grow to maturity and grow towards older age. But you see that I was not a poet, I was not an analyst, I was not really a writer of the words that are going to subsist on, the, on their own, I wasn't a painter, I wasn't an architect, so I was still a composer in sound and music. Tippett's next opera, King Priam, was based on the epic which has stirred all Western imagination. It's about war and peace, high courage and heroic love, and personal crisis at a time when the fate of nations is at stake. Then, five years ago, came his third opera, The Knot Garden, set in the modern world. It's a rhapsody and a drama, a sexual tangle, and an analysis of the clash of old values and new, country versus city. Goethe, shall we say, versus the Beatles. The consolations of a quiet, civilized, cultured life and the difficulty of reconciling this with our knowledge of starvation and oppression in the world that lies outside our own garden. It's all worked out in musical terms. When a gay young musician and an adolescent girl build up a dream fantasy between them, they do so to the music of Schubert. Schubert refashioned by Tippett. The fantasy is soon broken, broken by a single word of reality. But it's very beautiful and very real too, while it lasts. Do you like music? Music that's bitter sweet. Do you ever I think it's always been difficult for us to know, artists to know, what it is they are doing in, in our present society, present meaning for the whole of, say, this century. Perhaps it's never different from what it was before, but it seems to be different because we can look back in history and think that, you know, in the time of Beethoven or Mozart, that there was a particular society that wanted entertainment and, and et cetera, et cetera. Now that we live in a period in which we are so self-conscious altogether of what society is, what is happening, what is the breakup of society, or well, the crisis, or whatever the terms we use, then it seems as though the artist has a special place, or might have a special place, because, uh, as Eliot used to say, you, though you cannot turn the poet into the priest, and you can't put back the religious certainties through the poet, nevertheless, in the sense the public does look to the artist in a, oh dear, ever since the Romantic period, into something of a frightening role, as though there were some possibilities of sensibility in himself in works of art which could give you a feeling of life enhancement, of courage, of virtue, all these things, within a period which was, was, get, was getting, as it were, more and more difficult and Im impossible. Okay. I think the artist has had to accept that to a certain extent. His danger would be therefore, that he would become pretentious and would be laying down the law. It's very easy to fall into this trap. I'm sure one goes extremely close to it. And you only keep out of it by the most extreme attention to the actual craft of the, of the work. In other words, that then finally what should come out is a piece of a work of art which can, if you hope, be subsistent in itself and is independent of me or anybody who does it. Now, the artist must address himself to the people who do the technological things, but he is talking about something else, I think. In other words, you can, th you can think, I've often said to myself, supposing I went, was in a society much later and I'm taken to the moon. I don't go to the moon as a geologist or to look at the rocks. I would only, could only go as a person <laughs> talking music. You see, and this is the point. We've got to learn somehow to be able to believe that the man on the moon, when he goes there, 
inside his spacesuit is me, is you, is everyone, and that the emotional life, the need for um, other deeper feelings are in him. He, the language may be a problem, but fundamentally, what is, what, are, what is music talking about? It is talking about the sense of life as an interior flow in time. Now that's a very strange concept, but it's about as near as we damn well can get, get to what it is. And we sort of make timeless things which, when you go into the concert hall or over the radio, time stops, and yet the flow inside this work is something which gives you that experience which you need for a fuller life than can be got by solely looking through the microscope at the inner, inner age of the Duna rocks. At the turning point of Michael Tippett's third symphony, his latest big scale composition, he crashes into the chaos and confusion of Beethoven's ninth, using Beethoven's own notes. In Beethoven's symphony, remember, the answer to this is a huge affirmative ode to joy. All men will become brothers. Somewhere there does live a loving father. answer is possible in an age when, as Tippett himself has put it, God seems to have turned not his face but his backside on mankind. Tippett's answer to Beethoven's chaos breaks out in a set of blues based on Bessie Smith and Miles Davis. There are no big brave affirmations but nevertheless there is a celebration of the things that we can hold on to, a singing of a dream that may crack and crack again but which we must go on dreaming if life, says Tippett, is to hold any meaning. concern itself with that disrelated world and it must concern itself it seems to me I'm now talking personally f from the experience of my own lifetime that in a world where the not the scientific but where the where the social has been ca is becoming increasingly perhaps increasingly catastrophic where the inner world of man is equally catastrophic, they're not necessarily at the same time, all sorts of, all sorts of disturbances, that it means, it seems to me, that art must be intimately in tune or related to these, these confusions. But the process then is, you see, to, to, to as it were, to, to take the confusion as the black material and so to work upon it that, that something gives, comes out which we can call a work of art, which has this one absolute quality, that it's independent of the creator, that is the absolute, that it is something, some actual thing upon the wall, that some sound that is independent of everything and that when performed or when looked at is independent, it's eternal. You can get the same emotions if you go and look at the, uh, look at the pictures in the in the, in the Cro-Magnon caves of whatever it was before the Ice Age. And the sounds, if you could hear them, what they made, you'd have the same emotional things, the responses. Now this is what it is that we are doing. And although we may be more, find it more difficult, and this I think for younger people, are coming at the present moment, is getting in, possibly increasingly difficult. Because the world is larger, the world is more confused, the languages in which it's got to be spoken to everybody is either more primitive because it has to be a metaphor that which understood over the whole world like boy meets girl and that's the end of it or it has to be 
a series of languages of every kind, and it's the discovery and, and, in, and invention of these languages which is causing a, most of the trouble, in my opinion, about modern art. Because we can't distinguish, we haven't got a tradition which we can say, like in Mozart's time, oh, that's a beautiful piece of music, okay, that's good. We are in a position in which we don't know the answers to these things, and therefore we can't say, we are, that, say, 90%, 98%, of all that is invented nowadays by artistics is not going to stand. 2% do. I, nobody can just tell you what this 2% is going to be. So that we have to take it in our hands and, uh, and a hope, but we mustn't, I, I feel, simply discharge our own exasperations, perhaps upon the young people trying to, di trying to discover what the, what, what the languages are. Now, when it comes to persons as old as myself, it's clear that our languages are formed. We may broaden our, uh, our world all the time, as I would try to do, and you grow into it well, but in the end, of course, you grow into an older man's world in which you're growing towards the more eternal things and towards those things which have been there for generations upon generations. You are not there to invent. You are there as far as you humanly can to express. Tippett certainly is not an influential composer in the usual sense. He won't be a key figure a leader of movements when the musical history of our age gets written. Not in the way that John Cage and Karlheinz Stockhausen have been. But I do know that in three operas, three symphonies, two oratorios, and a good many pieces in all sorts of forms, Tippett has composed the music most potently charged with the cultural, social, and emotional currents of our age. In lines and colors and rhythms, he's given his ideas such vivid expression that more and more people are responding to his music, not just with liking, but with a kind of passionate fervor. I have been writing music for 40 years. And during this time, there have been huge and world-shattering events in which I have been inev inevitably caught up. Whether society has felt music to be useless or needful, I have gone on writing because I must. And I know that my true function within the society which embraces us all is to continue an age-old tradition which goes back into prehistory and goes forward into the unknown future. And this tradition is to create images out of the depths of the imagination and to give them form, whether visual or intellectual or musical. For it is only by this process of image making that the inner world can communicate at all. Images of the past, shapes of the future, images of figure for a decadent world or of calm for one too violent, Images of reconciliation for worlds that are torn by division and in a world of brutality, mediocrity, images of abounding, vigorous, joyous, exuberant beauty.